so it's kind of Sydney, this way more uh, it, it's, it's like great to welcome you back to Madison. Uh, this is John Tortorisi, and uh, we're interviewing Sydney I want her, who attended UW in what year? From 1967 to 71. Okay, and you graduated in history and uh, history and film. History and film. Okay. So where were you born? Here in Madison? Uh, Milwaukee. Uh, oh, Milwaukee. Okay. And my uh, my parents came here in 1950, and I found them about 1951. They just left me. In, <laughs> they left me in the Valide area uh, on, on Valide Street in, in Milwaukee. Um, my um, uh, Both my parents were from Europe. Um, and uh, my mother was from England, Cockney, and uh, my father was from Vilna, Lithuania. Really? Yeah. And he was a, um, he was a, actually he was a professional soldier. So, um, yes, so he, he fought from 1939 to 1945. Um, in? In Europe. In the U.S. Army? No. Oh, no, no, no. My father was, um, it was, you know, he, he came from a long line of um, Vilna rabbis. He said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. So he became a soldier. And at that time, Lithuania was part of Poland. So he became part of the Polish cavalry. And I still have some place in my, either in my apartment or my sister's, my father on his stallion in all his regalia oh, wow. as a Polish cavalry, a captain, Polish cavalry officer. And everybody knew he was Jewish, but I guess, you know. And um, uh, so uh, my, my father, uh, you know, like all Europeans at that time, it was fluent in like a half a dozen languages, you know. He knew Russian, um, uh, Polish, Lithuanian, um, he, you know. During the war, he, he learned enough, you know, French and German. Well, he had he also knew Yiddish and Hebrew, and so I mean, you know, he's um, um, that's that's what he that's what he did. He was a soldier, and um, I think I actually told uh, Professor Mossy this that my father was part of the last cavalry charge in European history. The, you know, at the siege of Warsaw, it was, you know, um, horse flesh against, you know, the Wehrmacht. <laughs> so guess who won, you know, but um, what was left of the Polish army um, fled through Yugoslavia into Italy because Italy had not declared war at the time. And my father ended up, you know, um, in the French army where he conveniently was left behind you know, when all the British left. So he was captured at Dunkirk. Oh, wow. And he spent four years in a uh, German prisoner of war camp. And they knew he was Jewish, but it was not run by the SS. It was run by the Prussian officers. So, you know, <laughs> they took out his appendix. That saved his life, you know. He escaped a few times. They shot him. They brought him back. He used to point out the bullets, various parts of his body. His favorite movie was... Um, was the great escape. It was just, it was an amazing thing. And then, then when the, the Americans um, liberated the camp, they, um, they gave him, like, I guess an M1 rifle and said, you know what, we need soldiers, you know, to defend us against uh, the German. And he says, what? And he ended up um, as part of the Battle of the Bulge. He <laughs> just, oh you know, it's just like, yeah, you know, it's, um, he was, um, he was, he was like, um, you know, the uh, Tom Hanks character. Hmm. You know, so. Um, well, this may explain some of your interest in history. It sounds as if you oh, I always, were immersed in it. Uh, well, from a child. Uh, 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 that along with the fact that, you know, where we settled in the Greenbush area in Madison had all these old people. I was like one of the few young kids. I mean, you know, but everybody, uh, they, were, they were old, you know, the Italians, the Jews, uh, old, old blacks from the South, um, you know, um, and 
basically everybody sat around telling, all these old people sat around and told stories. And I was just amazed by this stuff. I mean, you know, I heard everything, uh, you know, from, and I always thought, the, you know, all the Italian guys, they used to tell me stories about the fact that they were made men. Or, you know, that they had worked for Capone. And, you know, I, the, the old Jewish women would tell me about the pogroms in Russia, you know, in Poland. And the, um, you know, the, um, the elderly blacks would tell me about uh, the Jim Crow South. Well, yeah, it was the Jim Crow South. And, um, and, they, and, and we're talking about old people. And I'm like five or six years old. And I'm, I'm surrounded by like 70 and 80-year-old people. So we're talking about people who were born in the 1880s, you know, there, and then there were those who would like to tell, tell me stories about how they had fought in the, the Revolutionary War, and I, I was six <laughs> years old, okay, you know, the, and the Civil War, and, you know, the, you know the, the, um, the, these guys had met Sitting Bull and Cochise, and I'm just, wow, damn, you know, <laughs> you know, and, they, and the, the old ladies would just, would feed me pastries, <laughs> so I always... I was a great audience. I was just a great audience for that. So that, um, that culture of storytelling in that neighborhood, I, it's, it's lost. But it, it was it, it was lives, just wonderful. It lives virtually, and in in the sense that it's still uh, in the minds of those few people that remember the neighborhood. It's still so powerful. But oh, yeah. I was thinking of. Did you ever know Boof Trenelia? Yeah, Boof. Yeah, he was the quintess quintessential Greenbush storyteller. Yeah. That's what he did his whole life. I don't think he ever had another job. I, I don't he know. He was a bailiff, I guess. I, I, so. I, I, uh, I knew, I went to high school with, um, you know, with his relatives and, um, and with the Skiros and, 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 and um, a number of the, you know, the Italians. And what was, what was wonderful about the Greenbush area was that because everybody, as diverse as it was, everybody had one thing in common, a painful past. So, you know, I never, I, there was, I never heard anti-Semitic slurs, nobody had uh, black slurs, nobody, no, no, they just didn't, because there was always, the, there was always this anguish about so many of these people because they had escaped, and they all escaped from some some horrific environment, you know, and um, and it was it was working class. It was it was the only integrated area of Madison, and um, then uh, in in some ways it was the other in Madison, wasn't it? Because you know what it was? It was an city. embarrassment to a lot of people because it was so close to the state capitol, West Washington Avenue, in you know, in the forties and fifties was really a den of taverns. I mean, it really was. Uh, um, what happened was that it just became um, too, too much of a, um, I wouldn't call it a ghetto, because it really wasn't, but it was, it was too much of, a, uh, uh, of an eyesore. And that sort of eyesore really began to uh, weigh heavily on people in the, uh, the city council, Obviously, this, the state assembly. I mean, they you know you drive up there. This was before John Nolan. <laughs> you drive up there, and you'd see you'd see you know like um, the Gurky um, junkyard. I think it was also the the Paley junkyard that w was there. You know, which were great places to play in if you you know <laughs> if you wanted to be surrounded by things that could kill you repeatedly. You know, and the nails. Snikos. A sniper. Sniper. We used to play in a sniper. <laughs> yeah, and so again, you know, it, it was, it, it was a, it was a historical environment. It wasn't like, oh, I'm living in Shorewood Hills, so you know, it's like I'm um, surrounded by rich people. Who cares? <laughs> there, there was, there was really that that sort of Alan Lomax kind of storytelling, that, you know, and it was, um, and they, and they would, it, it was always in a lot of broken English. And they, it was just these people were like making up words, you know. And I would just, I would just sit there, uh, you know, mesmerized by this stuff, you know. And um, I just thought, wow, this is. So, was there a teacher, uh, an individual that encouraged you to attend UW to 
um, major in history. You, How did you get... Let me tell you something. Back <laughs> then, back then, I was one of those high school students that could barely, um, could barely spell high or school. And, you know, I, I, they also discovered that I was, like, dyslexic, you know? So, so by the time I was in eighth grade and I was ready to drop out already, um, um, I was reading on a third grade level. And it was a teacher who finally discovered this, a guy named Mark Parrish uh, in eighth grade, who, believe it or not, while I was looking for um, high school classmates, I went out looking for him because he saved my life. He, you know, when they talk about teachers saving a student's life, that was the prime example, at least for me. And because, you know, every day after class, you know, I had to spend an hour before I went home in his class where he basically tutored me, He, you know. And um, he brought up my reading level from like a second or third grade to by the end of the year, like ninth grade level. And um, prior to that, I, I hated reading because I, I couldn't read. I just hated it. And um, as, an, as an aside, um, I could read Hebrew easier than I could read English, you know, like for my bar mitzvah, that kind of stuff. And then as soon as I had that, I quit that too. But I mean, you know, um, but that's a different story. The, um, but the fact is that that teacher, and he was, um, he was a former teamster, and he was built like a beer barrel. I mean, he was like maybe five six, five seven. He looked like a professional wrestler, though, you know. And um, so he would tell me stories about the Teamsters, and um, everything was storytelling around. Um, I never wanted to just hear lessons. I wanted to hear stories. Even in Long in Longfellow Grade School, we had teachers who would who would read us, and some of those teachers were older than dirt. I mean, I remember going up to my sixth grade teacher and asking her if she um, if she had actually fought in the French and Indian War because you know it's because she was just old and wizened she and now she, she must have been born about 18 uh, this was 1959 so she was born probably around 18 1890 you know and um, it was like, you know, when they would just sit and reminisce. Everyone would love to sit and reminisce. Once you ask somebody, tell us about yourself, that sort of thing. You know, they um, told about, you know, growing up in Kansas, outhouses, you know, there were no cars, there were no airplanes, and, you know, it was like all that kind of stuff. And I, again, that sort of stuff mesmerized me. And um, so, but getting back to, getting back to Mark Parrish, he was the, he was the teacher. And I, I looked him up, and he's now retired um, in, in Florida, he had no idea who I was, but, you know, because he had had tens of thousands of students, that kind of stuff, but I, I basically told him this, I, I, had to, I thanked him, and he says, you know, you're about to make me cry, he's like 80 years old now, and, he's, and I says, well, you saved my dimpled white ass, man. I mean, I was, I was just, I was, I was heading for some no good areas, you know, uh, and, and there were a lot of, there were a lot of students at Central, at that time, who didn't have that sort of care, and they dropped out, you know, and um, I was just very, very lucky, because... Um, so you came to campus in 1967? All of us could. See, that was the other thing. I couldn't probably get into uh, the UW now, but back then, if you were a townie, <laughs> you were automatically mm -hmm. accepted. Mm -hmm. So, sure. I mean, you know, even though I had maybe a high school, maybe a, a B level, you know, um, uh, you, were, you, were, you were accepted. I mean, my, my first class at the UW was uh, get rid of English first, you know, English comp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. like, um, but after that, it was, um, I took as many history classes as I could. So... In those years, UW was essentially free. I mean, it was like two hundred dollars. I think when I it was one hundred and sixty, was two fifty. 
when I started. <laughs> I mean, it was just, you know, and... Um, there was that one period in the university's history where they had this idea that higher education should be essentially free in public institutions. It was like at Berkeley. It didn't last long, but it was there, and we um, were lucky. No, I mean, I, I was... I, but I also lived at home mm -hmm. because I... Uh, I, uh, I was still working with my dad, <laughs> in, in, you know, because my father was the last kosher butcher of Madison, Wisconsin. And so, uh, I, you know, after school, grade school, and then high school, and even college until the store closed in 69, there I was, you know, working in the store afterwards, you know, cutting flunkin'. <laughs> Cutting flanken right here, almost cut the entire, anyway, Ooh. but, um, so yeah, that's what I, uh... And that store was on Mills Street in... Mills and Chandler. I remember that place. Yeah. Uh, um, Howard Temin, you know, remember Howard Temin? He used to come there. Yes, and uh, even after he won the Nobel Prize, he used to, used to show up there, and i say, wow, you know, I didn't understand a thing he said. But it didn't make any difference. I still wrapped the meat as well as for anybody. So, so you were you came to campus in 1967. Seven. So, what were your experiences? Did you get the feeling that the turmoil here in that year um, was appreciated in the rest of the city? What what, what right. was the milieu like? And in, in because I live because I uh, you know um, I lived on. Uh, on Chandler Street, and I went to Central. Most of the time, I didn't take the bus home. I'd walk home from Central, and I'd walk down State Street. And I walked down, you know, it's, I, you know, and it like, from, especially from like tenth grade on, I walked down State Street because I like looking at the girls, <laughs> and um, you know, trying to get into bars I couldn't get into, even though it was like eighteen at that time, and. Um, so what what I would do is, and I I've been wondering whether I can still do this walk up, <laughs> Bascom, but I used to, I used to just from the time I was about fifteen, I used to walk around the campus on the way home, you know, and then I'd I'd go past I uh, you know maybe it's Van Vleck you know and then down and then you know uh, down Mill Street and stuff like that, um, um so. Um, I, I was there when the, the, the tumult began. You know, I would see, I would see, you know, demonstrations already by 80, by, uh, by 65. And, um, you know, I'd read all the posters on the, on the, you know, on the walls and the, um, and the telephone poles. And I, I was just, wow, this is great. I mean, you know, in fact, it got to the point where I was, <laughs> I was skipping too much class in high school. I wasn't. I was. I actually sat in on lectures. You know, I didn't know who these people were. I didn't even know what the lecture was. But I just sat in. I just wanted to see. I wanted to feel what the um, the college experience was. And that's. And one time, I don't know. I it might have been at agriculture, Aggie Hall. There, that's where I stumbled onto uh, Harvey Goldberg, and. When I heard him, I, I was gobsmacked. I'd never seen anything like this in my life, you know. And um, I actually told the kids in high school about this guy, and they basically said, "Yeah, but what about the girls?" So he says, "Wait, forget about this. You, you, this, this. You can't imagine this guy, you know." It's like, "Yeah, yeah, but what about the girls?" Um, I was here when um, I was actually. Um, at the um, at the lecture where Wayne Morris and Ernest Gruning, the senators, the only two senators that voted against the um, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, they were here. And, um, and I, ironically, Wayne Morris and I went up to him. Lived at my father's meat market in the 1920s. He, he he had a he had an apartment in there. It was at the corner of Mills, and um, Mills and Chandler. He Wayne Morris was there. You know, it's like, 
And um, that's a name from the. Was he a UW grad? Yes, yes, he was that's the senator from that, Oregon. It's he's not remembered, but you're so right. He was a he was one. He of, should be remembered. I mean, you know, and same that. with the the guy from Alaska. And so, but I was there, and somewhere in the black hole I call my apartment, I still have their autographs. You know, and their little and these, uh, you know, the three by five note cards. Um, but from the very beginning, I was. Um, you know, I was really politically aware, and um, so. Uh, and what would happen is that, but but so many of the boys that I, you know, I hung around with, couldn't wait to go into the army. They couldn't wait to kill something, because they were tired of just hunting deer. They wanted to kill something. And, you know, there's, and back then, you know, you you really, you know, their their fathers were either, you know had fought in Korea or World War II, and there was that, there was a different form of patriotism. You know, if the government said these guys are, um, are enemies, are villains, then they have to be killed. And of course, you know, it, 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 there was that form of racism. I mean, that was the other thing. I mean, you know, they were, they were yellow, so, uh, um, yeah, they, they deserved what they got, that kind of thing. And they were commies. So, um, so when did you decide then to make to focus on history and when I heard you, Harvey Goldberg? Okay, so it was Harvey that, and I and, and that was and I was like sixteen, and again I just stumbled into that into that room, and I had, uh, in fact, they even made a comment about that today on Facebook. To this day, I, I am just. You know, I am mesmerized by this man, and um, which is the reason why um, I surreptitiously taped him, even after he said, "Absolutely not, I don't allow taping." You know, was, so how did you do that? You you'd have to sneak the the recorder. Oh, this was great. This was good. this was like real, you know, black ops type of thing back then. Um, I had my I had my bar mitzvah bell and howl. This boxy thing, you know, that I had gotten in 1962, you know, with the little, um, you know, with the with the cord and the mic, and it wasn't like this at all. Okay, <laughs> so I said to myself, how would I, how would I do this? And so I had watched enough James Bond movies and and spy flicks in like Flynn and things like that that. Every time I went in, and I, I wasn't this surreptitious with, with Mossy, because he didn't, I never asked him, he didn't seem to care. He didn't care. Harvey cared, you know, and, you know, and I, like I said, the, 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 uh, the Taliban around him, his fanatics, would have beaten me to death, figuring I was, you know, some sort of government agent. But what I did was that I, um, I had... I taped. You have. You've got to see this Bell and Howell thing. You know. I taped to my stomach. I weaved the the mic cord all the way down here, and I always wore. And nobody seemed to pay any attention to the fact that even in the fall, when it was really hot and humid, or the spring, when it was, you know, you didn't need to wear all this bulky winter clothes. There's this guy, and he's sitting in the front row. Hmm. And this, th and I've got it right here. And I would always, um, you know, uh, when necessary, when I I figured there was something, you know, there there might be some sort of mic interference, I'd move the hand here, move it here, move it here. Nobody paid any attention. I think they were scared of me because it was like here's this guy, and he was, you know, he was wearing all this bulky stuff, and they were sixty minute tapes, and luckily, Harvey spoke literally for sixty minutes. He'd start and, you know, and it was really weird because I wouldn't want to start the tape until he began. So I'd be doing all these sorts of gymnastic movements just so that I could, you know, push the plug in at the right moment, you know. And, um, and I did this dozens and dozens of times. And, um, and the tapes are in the, uh, you know, the Goldberg Center. And what I discovered... When I was telling this to um, um, Professor McCoy, you know, when I finally gave him the tapes, this was, I think, 2004, maybe a little earlier, and I had 
kept these tapes in as pristine condition as possible um, in Dutch Master cigar boxes, literally under my bed, wrapped up in cellophane. You know, it's like you know, it says, "Oh my God, the guy!" You know, it's like it's like the fanatics who uh, who handle comic books. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, I did this, and um, and there were dozens of them. Um, so, um, and and given the conditions, they're not bad. They, I, I've heard the the digitized uh, the copies, and they're you know, there's there's a there's a lot of ambient noise, of course, and I always try to stay away from anybody who talked in class, who laughed in, I mean, clapped loudly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was one, there was one time where I was sitting in front of two girls who were talking about the dates the night before, and I basically turned around and said, shut the fuck up, you know? And I'm glad the boyfriends weren't there because they were like big, huge guys, I, I discovered. And they shut up, you know, because the master was speaking. So... What was it like in a Harvey class? I took his classes too, but... Uh, when did you take him? Uh, in uh, the early 70s, 71, 72. All right. He well, was very much the same, uh, the, but he was a performer. Oh, he yeah. Was in, he oh, really yeah. engaged your attention. He would just, walk... Uh, yes, what he would do is he would walk out from one of the wings. You know, he'd just walk out. No notes. You know, and it's this kind of this this hawk face, the nose, and you know he and very lean. I mean, just he was like emaciated, you know. And he also had like nasal problems sometimes, you know, he, a, a sinus condition. And so he smoked so much five packs a day. Or something. Yeah, I mean, but we never saw that, you know. He, you know, and um, but he'd walk, and then he'd do a he'd do a profile like Sarah Bernhardt. He would just, you know, and he'd, he'd do this, and then he'd start. Yeah. He, he, would, he would just do some sort of mannerism. Take his glasses off. You know, he'd do this. <laughs> and this. And then, boom. He was, he was off to the races. And in all the years and the, and the dozens and scores of lectures I heard, he never stumbled once. He never said, ah. Uh, it was it was as if he was on some sort of accelerated you know alternative plane and he was speeding through the universe and it was it was so erudite and his references in french or in german uh the the, the dates were were they were always, they were always at the tip of his tongue. I've never, I've, and I've heard great speakers. I actually, I actually heard Martin Luther King here. You know, I, I've heard great speakers. I can imagine what William Jennings Bryan was, or or the guys that would do the Chautauqua circuit. You know, I've never heard a speaker like that ever. It's. I could see where this would resonate in particular with. Uh, what you said about storytelling as a child, oh, yeah. and, and Harvey was a storyteller, and he told stories in an incredibly uh, effective way, um, and in a, an accessible way for undergraduates. You were and, swallowed yeah. into history. Yeah. You were there in at the barricades, in you know, in eighteen seventies Paris. Mm -hmm. You were there, like, at the, you know, just, just imagine, you know, the, the, the visceral sensation of watching Eisen, Eisenstein's, you know, uh, Odessa step sequence. You were, you were literally on those steps. Um, you, were, uh, you were in the, uh, the, the syndicalist movement. Um, the, the, uh, the, you were there when... Uh, Jean Jaurès was assassinated. I, I, I mean, it was like a, 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 you know, you were you were in the carriage when the you know um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was 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 shot. You were sitting between him and his wife. I mean, you know, it was like it was like that. Um, 
it, it was one of those, and you, you know, you were at the guillotine. You, you were, you, were, you were closer than uh, than Madame uh, Defarge. I, I, I mean, you know, and his, he just, he, he, he was just so much of a, a genius that you, you know, it, it, you didn't really need to learn anything else. It was like ah, I've learned enough about the French Revolution because I have. You know, I've I've sat through a, a semester of Harvey's, of Harvey Goldberg, and I'm, I'm and I'm not slighting Professor Mossy, sure. but his style was different. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to <laughs> Mossy. Um, so you took courses in tandem, Goldberg yeah. Mossy, like yeah. many people did. Yeah. Um, a Petrovich class every so often. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel that there was in a sense, a competition yes. for students and the, the oh, yeah, absolutely, them. absolutely, and but you know, mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 difference was, you know, and I said this to somebody, and it wasn't it wasn't meant disparagingly back then, but I said, you know, Harvey is one of the Valkyries. <laughs> Professor Mossy is Siegfried. Mm. That's, he's just you know he's just. You know, or he's Barbarossa. I mean, this guy—he's just—he's—he's he's there. He's a pillar. You know, it's like you're not gonna get past him. Um, and um, but he was, um, yeah. But 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 Professor Mossy's class was in a way totally different um, because it was it was far less emotional, but much more. Um, there was much more of a sinister aspect because of you know, um, and 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 I always thought it was much more melancholy and dour because when you're talking about Nazism, when you're talking about anti-Semitism, when you're talking about you know your Euro European form of racism, the way Harvey described it, you couldn't wait to battle it. With Professor Mossy, it was like. You know, it, it was like the Johnstown flood coming towards you. There was nothing you could do about it. You just had to, you know, sit there and wait for the deluge. And um, but the, the but the point was, in the end, the same. It, it was to make you think critically oh, absolutely. and act. Oh yeah, and um, but the, the the thing is though that George never said, jump on the barricades. Yeah. <laughs> Harvey said, jump on the barricades, use your body, you know, that sort of thing, metaphorically. metaphorically. But he didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Oh, he had a great place in Paris, that's, that's what I hear, you know. <laughs> and, um, but I, I was always surprised that the tapes that I had of, uh, of uh, Professor Goldberg were like the earliest extant ones and I didn't understand that because you know he had he had spoken he had been a professor at Ohio State in the early 60s and he actually gave like radio lectures but obviously they were never recorded I, I that I didn't understand so you know the and by I guess the late 70s Harvey had no problem with having like professionals standing there with you know the recording stuff but so that's I was really surprised by that um, and and even the um, the lectures that I uh, I recorded of uh, Professor Mossy's, there might be a couple of earlier ones, but not too many. And I, 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 I that I didn't understand either. Well, there the difference was that George was uh, recorded for University of the Air, and Harvey wasn't. Um, and we I don't know why that's the case. Harvey never won a teaching award. He never was recognized by the university no. for his teaching. I don't know if his WHA would have not allowed him uh, to be part of that series because of his political. And he was not views. much of a other than his biography of Jaurès. He was not a writer. He was not right. a you he know he wasn't a published uh, right. professor. That's right. So, um, so let's get to the 1971 class. This was the class, the first class that George taught specifically on Jewish history. Yeah. 
and you taped that class. Yes. It was a it's a it's a very historic class because it's one of the first courses in a public university. Uh, see, I didn't know that. I, you know, I figured they they were doing this at at NYU. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like. Um, but, um, but for a public school, especially in the Midwest, I think it was really uh, a pioneer course. Yeah. I think before that, George would uh, integrate Jewish history in his other courses, but this was the first one that specifically was dedicated to, uh, to Jewish history. Uh, so to some extent, he was writing the lectures as he went along. Um, but they, they seemed to hold together coherently, and he focused on the, uh, the German Jewish, and then yeah. he had others who actually went on to great careers like Alice Alba do the um, Eastern European history. Um, but could you tell us a bit about how this class was received by the students? We noticed that in the questions and answers, uh, the students seem to have very little knowledge of Jewish history and in particular of the Holocaust, and they were quite stunned. This again go, perhaps goes back to what you said about uh, that you were, in George's case, pulled into the cruelty of history. Uh, you were pulled into the darkness of, of of human behavior. It must be a Jewish thing. <laughs> I will tell you that, uh, I will tell you that the, the history that, um, that George was talking about was not a history I was unfamiliar with. I mean, I, you know, I, um, my, my dad came out of Eastern Europe. I mean, uh, he lost his he lost his family, uh, not in any of the concentration camps, but by partisans just shooting them in the head. Um, so, I mean, you know, um, I knew about Eastern European stuff. I also had read a number of books, you know, on the Enlightenment, on, you know, on Moses Mendelssohn, on, on you know, the, uh, the rise of the Rothschilds. I mean, it, it, it wasn't unfamiliar territory. At least for me, for the others, yeah, I could, I could, I could tell that it was as unfamiliar as Catholicism might be to a Hindu, and, you know, because it's like, and, and also remember back then there was a tremendous amount of, you know, let's let's throw away any form of religiosity unless it's like. Um, whatever the new age thing was, you know. Um, I remember uh, talking to a lot of Jewish students from everywhere from New York to Skokie, you know, <laughs> and they couldn't wait, you know, to disentangle themselves from, you know, the, the Yiddishkeit. You know, they, they, you know, and it's like, and <laughs> I'm the son of the kosher butcher, <laughs> you know, and, you know, it's, it's like I'm, I'm arguing with these people about, you know, you, you know, it's like um, all of this stuff. And, and a lot of them had come from, like, you know, reform, uh, reform backgrounds. And um, so it was, um, it, 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 it was something that uh, I had a great deal of difficulty with. Uh, with some of these students because, as I said, no matter how far you run, they will always find you, you know, which, which is just so Jewish. <laughs> it's like, you know, and, um, but, but it's, uh, but in that regard, it, you know, it was true. And a lot of these, uh, you know, the, um, a lot of the Jewish kids might have heard about this from their, you know, their booby and their Zeta and, you know, that kind of stuff. And they ignored it. The, uh, the non-Jewish kids, though, even by that time, had very little idea about the Holocaust, had, very, had no idea about Jewish history, other than the fact that, uh, you know, as one of them said, I wanted to come in to, to, to see, you know, how they were running Wall Street, you know. So the, you, you had that sort of um, 
you know, the, 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 that 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 kind of um, um, anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. um, you know, which you which you hear today. I mean, you know, it's um, the dark forces that run the media and Wall Street and uh, Goldman Sachs and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, and it was it was a it was a class that, if I remember correctly was not packed and it was um and and the reading um the, the reading list was difficult but it wasn't unfamiliar to me um it was a capped class and that there was only a certain number of students that were allowed it was a small class probably because it was the first time they taught it but we had the feeling of just listening to some of the tapes, a kind of emotional intensity mm -hmm. that that perhaps, as you said, this was the first time many of these students were engaged in this history, and it was well, it did come at a particular time because you know in those years the Holocaust still was not as prominent a part of yeah, uh, but I Jewish also, identity. I also think that that Professor Mossy was digging really deeply into his own soul. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about, you know, intellectual or intellectual history of, like, the 18th and 19th century. It's another thing to talk about the reason why you had to scram out of Berlin, mm -hmm. you know, and that your, your relatives were involved, um, that sort of thing. I mean, you know, so there was... It, it was... It was the sort of e emotional impact that you could hear in his voice. Hmm. So, you know, it's and um, so that was you know. Uh, I do think that that George always used history to understand himself. That he he used it. Well, this is very simplistic, but almost kind of as a form of of uh, therapy. Uh, a, a, a form of um, uh, understanding self-analysis, personal, yes, through an intellectual engagement. Um, I mean, I think you know when when um, uh, we thought about uh, entitling his memoir "Finding Myself in History." Um, we didn't use that title, but I think he did use history in that. And he used, it, it, throughout his career, he uh, invested, investigated areas of history that resonated with his own um, preoccupations. So perhaps this was the first time that he engaged in that I, I, that, I would, that I wouldn't know, no. but, I, you know, it was... Um, um, I found it a, you know, I found it a very um, edifying class, um, and, uh, you know... Well, I, and thank you for taping it. For us, yeah, it's absolutely. just really... Oh, well, see, but I was, I, I did that only because I wanted my dad to hear it, you know, and um, first time you heard Mossy's voice, he says, where's he from? <laughs> no, he's cool, Dad. He's cool. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like really okay. Um, <laughs> his his voice had about three different accents going at one time. Yeah, right? it's, you know, and um, so um, well, I didn't realize. See, I I didn't realize that that um, no one else had, you know, was taping it. Um, you know, it just, I, I just, I did it because I wanted my dad to hear the tapes and, uh, and my mom, but primarily my dad. And, um, it was, um, yeah, he, he, he used to, he, he would always say, yeah, you know, I, I don't know much about, you know, uh, the German Jews. When's he going to start on Polish ones? <laughs> So he says, he never know, got I'll, to him. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk to him about it. Let's see what he does, you know? And um, so, yeah. But uh, so anything to help.
So the in many excuse ways. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. The quality of the tapes are good though, because I've I've heard the you know I don't I don't I never got a a digital copy of the uh, of the mossy stuff, but I have all of the uh, the Goldberg. So we just went through a process of restoring the audio. We had one done one pass of cleaning it up, but we a specialist at continuing studies went through and pulled out a lot of the ambient noise yeah. and the background noise specifically for the course that we're offering, but that's something we'll do eventually with the whole series. But one of the questions we had was, do you know where the tapes, do you have those tapes still? I gave, no, I gave, I gave everything to, uh-oh, uh, what? To... Well, Professor the original McCoy. cassette, well, we could ask uh, Al. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, he, I gave him, um... All you know, I gave him all my um, my Dutch master. Mm -hmm. Nice, you know. Okay, and uh, no, thank you. Unless of course that. he has sold them on the black market. Yeah. <laughs> that I can't tell you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you said, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, what what do they ha they have to have them? Otherwise, so what we what I always had was an MP3. So they had been initially digitized. Yes, we, we did. Thought, we had them digitized. Right. But we thought with with the process that we're going through trying to clean them up it might be easier if we read because technology has come so far in the last 10 years since they were first Jeez, I hope he didn't throw them out I'll talk to them and we'll find them yeah uh, uh, so threaten them with tenure yeah <laughs> <laughs> so many of the much of the anti-war activity on campus in those years really originated in the history department and other departments in the humanities and in and social sciences, um, not in engineering. <laughs> yeah, I mean they were, of course, it was the draft, and and so they could be pulled in as as part of of pro specific protests in a way that probably now would be more, much more difficult, but. Um, were you involved at all um, in the protests, and did you? Uh, could you tell us about what it was like in the history department? In uh, do you have do you have David Moranis's? They do you have a copy of it here? Not in the office. They marched into sunlight. sunlight. Do you actually? It's probably. I'll show you me. You're in one of the. Yeah. I am. I am in one of the. I am in one of the definitive uh, pictures of of the Dow Chemical riots. Huh. I'll show you exactly where I am. I am in that picture where the cops have charged out of the building and one guy is about to get hit in the head with a baton. Baton, I am two people behind that and, you know, kind of bug-eyed. <laughs> it's like, you what? know. What's happening? What's yeah. happening? That was, yeah. So what motivated you to take part? I was really pissed off. I, I mean, you know, I was even... Even though, you know, the night of that draft, hmm. where, you know, and I, I still remember it because I, I was there at the Union, you know, and I, I talk about the Wailing Wall when some of the early numbers came up. Girls were crying, guys were crying, you know, um, and there was all this screaming and shouting going on at the, at the Student Union. And I'm there with a couple of my friends, and I haven't heard my number. And I, you know, you, you just literally couldn't hear anything. So finally, I figured, oh my God, I, I, you know, I don't know, what, I'm going to have to figure out a way. My dad had already said, you're going to Canada. And he was a professional soldier. He said, you're not going, in. first of all, <clears throat> you'll shoot your own foot off. <laughs> it's like, thanks, Dad. And, um, but um, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go to Vietnam. But the, the, so, but at the end of the evening, um, I discovered that my number was 362. It's like, wow, man. You know, all my other friends were like 300, three, you know, so I, we, were, we were lucky in that regard. And, and I will tell you, from that time on, I really saw a decrease in certain areas of radicalism because if you were safe from the draft, you, you know, you, you didn't have the same sort of intensity. <clears throat> <clears throat> Obviously, not throughout the not throughout the campus, and you, you had the uh, um, you, you had the army math bombing and, and 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 things like that. But I did see 
a little more relaxation. Mm. Um, but for those, it was interesting is there was a relaxation on one part, but there was more intensity and anger for those that were involved. You know, they became and, more radical. Yeah. As oh, yeah. Court. Um, yeah. I, you know, I remember uh, seeing uh, Tom Hayden because, you know, he came out of um, Michigan. Uh -huh. So, the, you know, the, the, the 62 Port Huron statement for the SDS. Yeah, he'd be there. Uh, he'd be w walking around. Um, but there was what I did discover is the, the, the sort of phoniness that you that you see in in political movements especially here in America where if it was too cold hey we're gonna you know I, I remember going into the student union and you know and I noticed that during certain times of the afternoon when there were soaps that were going on as God is my witness you'd see these radicals watching the soaps and then they'd go out afterwards and you know they demonstrate that was what george always teased his students yeah, yeah. oh but, yeah you know he i think of, of any professor probably on campus he probably was the one that was most he baited them knowledgeable <laughs> just, and prepared for the student uh, rebellion or revolts of the 60s because he had been in paris in the 30s and had witnessed a, a lot of mass demonstrations and been involved in in that uh, against the Spanish Civil War and so he came with a lot of knowledge oh, yeah. and background and, and the students I think he goaded the students and, and tried to get them to think more strategically. Well th that and you know it, it'd be one thing when Harvey would talk about you know the the May 68 riots in Paris and it was like oh my god it's it's second only to Joan of Arc, you know. So it was it was that kind of intensity, mm -hmm. and you know George would kick back and say, "It's all bullshit." Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be able to do you know that sort of stuff. You know, it's like I don't know whether he used the word bullshit. He might have been German. I I don't know what it was, but um, yeah, the um, but but you do have a a a, a sense of rationality among Professor uh, Mossy's. Mm -hmm. Lectures. I mean, you know, it's uh, whereas you know, uh, Professor Goldberg was uh, okay. It's time to go to the barricades yeah. again and again and again. No matter how many times, you're still going to go. Yeah, that's amazing. I was thinking about a point that you made earlier about how Mossy's or John and you were talking about Mossy's biography, and in the '71 class, one of the questions students keep asking him is, "Why didn't Jews fight back?" Like, why didn't they take oh, yeah. arms? And and I think maybe that did strike a personal note for Mossy, who left. And I was thinking about, and his uh, his response would always be, "There was no coherent, there's no Jewish thing. That was something in Hitler's imagination. That the Jews of Europe were spread across geography. They're spread across social boundaries. They're not. There's not a Jewish monolith." Well, that along with the fact that you know. Um, a lot of nobody had the number of guns. My dad didn't see a gun until he joined the army. Mm -hmm. You didn't, you know, um, he had guns for hunting, but you, you you didn't have the sort of lunatic proliferation you have in this country. Right. And also, as as I George tried to explain, that it's really if you're a minority of twenty in a village, in the shtetl, how are you going to fight back, you know, with pitchforks? Uh, especially when everybody, you know, for the last 200 years had been revved up to believe, you you know, you were the devil itself. So, I mean, you know, um, it's, uh, you fought back, you know, when they finally got guns at the Warsaw Ghetto, they, they fought back right. and, and things like that. But it's, um, you can you can say the same thing about you know the the slaughter of the the Belgian Africans you know uh, you know at the time of uh, King Leopold right millions were killed okay yeah. uh, why didn't they fight why didn't the what was it the uh, 
the Hutus right. fight back. In Rwanda, I, there there are times when you just can't. Yeah. You just the thing you you fight by feet don't fail me now. Yeah. That sort of thing. Um, well, George used to say that survival was a, a a form of resistance. Yeah. Just being in in such extreme circumstances. Yeah. I think that's partly why I spent so much time on the stereotype to try and explain to the students that there's this thing in people's imaginations. They don't see Jews as a person. They see they have this idea that's been revved up and he traces it. And I think it's in part in response to You know what you, you also you, what you, you see it today in in alt right terminology. It's not the ugly kind of anti Semitism. It's like when a you know that piece of shit Steve, Steve Miller, who's Jewish, you know, from Santa Monica, who you know whose parents are millionaires, used the word cosmopolitan, you know, and you know right away what he's talking about. Um, the uh, so you know, Mossy would have a field day with guys like uh -huh. that because they That's really true. are they really are the. What's the German term? Uh, the Jews that helped the Nazis, the Juden, right? Uh, Judenbach. Yeah. Judenbach. yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, so. Yeah, I mean, the terminology, the terminology has changed, but the um, but the emotions behind it remain the same. Yeah. Still red hot, and um, well, perhaps we should uh, move on now. Is there anything else you want to say about your time at UW? Um, with your other professors? Well, I, I, I will say that if, if, if I hadn't had a girlfriend who typed all my papers, I'd probably still be a student, <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, playing uh, hearts in the union. Um, you know, right outside the Paul Bunyan room, which hasn't opened yet. Um, I, I will tell you that um, I don't think you really appreciate an education until years later. Mm. You don't appreciate teachers, the influence they have, uh, unless you stay within academia. If you don't, you know, if um, you, you, it only comes back to you um, either when, either when you decide you want to become reflective about life or you have kids of your own. Um, but I'm always talking up Wisconsin. Um, I, I, even though I live in Los Angeles, every day I read the, I read the Times, Channel 3000, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Wisconsin Alliance, all this other stuff. And I'm always posting it on Facebook. People still think I'm, I, I live in Madison, so no, I don't <laughs> live in Madison. Um, and I get really, really angry at, at the cuts Scott Walker and these, and these mumsers are trying to do here. Um, uh, yesterday, um, I was at the uh, Special Collections at the Memorial uh, Library because there are a couple of things I, you know, it's, it, I've reached that certain age. You know, there's there's nothing like having a six-hour uh, angioplasty. You know, where they stick heart stents in, and you hear doctors, you know, hotshot cardiologists talking about a lot of stuff when you're watching, you know. You're, you're watching the transformation of a clogged up Mississippi River Valley, uh, you know, back into normal shape again, for you to start thinking about, geez, what am I going to do with all the crap that I've, I've collected over the years? And um, so, you know, this is one of those times where, you know, I was at the Chasen yesterday. There's stuff that, you know, I, I, I want to give them. And uh, there's some special collections books and, 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 and things like that. It becomes, you know, it's it's that sort of melancholy trip that you really don't want to take, but you know eventually, you know. Uh, There's also UW archives if you have uh, UW-related materials. They, they I, well, uh, that's why I gave the tapes. I figured, mm -hmm. you know, what was the point of keeping those? Um, you know what? I, uh, and here we go with my mother again. I was talking to the I, I was talking to the, um, uh, the special collections people yesterday, and I said, I had, because from like 1965 to 1971, I spent a good deal of my time 
taking posters off of telephone poles and, and walls and, and once they once they were done and collecting them and putting them away in nice little um, liquor boxes, you know, and uh, from Sonico, and, you know, and, I, and you know, the black light posters and all of this stuff, you know, and um, I tell my mother, don't throw them out. I'm only going to UCLA, you know, it's, I'm, I am not going to the moon. I come back, this is 71, I come back summer of 72, all gone. I says, and I said to her, I says, Ma, what did you do? She says, well, you know, son, we didn't think you were ever going to come home again. And I said, Ma, I called you every other day. What are you talking about? <laughs> he says, well, you know, you're not here. And so uh, you don't love us. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> it's like, you know, something straight out of an Isaac Singer <laughs> short story. And I so says, this brings up then your post UW career. What did you do? Did you? How did you end up in the entertainment business? I slept with all the wrong people. <laughs> um, what happened was, it's like I went out to UCLA Film School. I got accepted to. Uh, I got accepted there, but I, I didn't like it. In fact, I basically dropped out after maybe a year, year and a half. Why? Because academically, it was the pits. You, you know, I had. Oh, oh no, thank you. I had especially compared to UW, right? Yeah. I'm, no, I'm being serious about that. I had my major professor in film was uh, uh, Russell Merritt, fantastic teacher, PhD, you know, from Harvard in comp lit, and he used to say to me, he's now Ber he's Berkeley emeritus now. He used to say to me, you don't study film as Unless you, you don't study film as film, it's part of an interdisciplinary uh, study. So, in other words, if you're going to study film, you study it through English lit, French lit, uh, history, comp lit, you know, economics. It doesn't make any difference. But it's not the film is an art form, but it also is as an art form. You if you're if you're studying Renaissance artists. You have to study Italian. You have to study the history. You have to know what's going on in Florence and Venice and Rome at the time. Okay. The teachers at UCLA at that time, and maybe still there, all they did was study film. But they studied film as if it were in a vacuum. They might as well have just been reading Daily Variety. I hated it. I hated it with a passion. There was no intellectualism. Um, there was, it was, it was like a wasteland and I was really pissed because I had also gotten accepted to NYU and, um, you know, and, but I couldn't afford NYU and I, I could afford UCLA only because if you stayed there for a year, you'd become a California resident. And, um, so I basically dropped out after about a year, a year and a half. And I thought to myself, oh, should I go back to Madison? No, because I don't want my mother telling me, well, I told you so. I, I, honest to God. So I stayed out in Los Angeles, and I uh, weaseled my way into a job. My girlfriend, who I met here in, in Madison, we went out together to Los Angeles. And um, so she had gotten a job at, um, at J. Walter Thompson. And... One day, she says to me, Sydney, there's a job. I, I hear from a friend who's working at a TV station, Channel 9, uh, which was General Tire at the time, um, which is now owned by Disney. The, um, <clears throat> the station, the, there's a job available there as a teletypist. You can type, and uh, maybe you can go get the job and get off your ass. I says, okay. And I, I went there, I got the job, and the reason I got the job was that the person who had promised she wanted it had gone elsewhere, and they just needed somebody. And so I actually had to take a typing test. And so, and I had prior to that worked at the phone company for 18 months as a teletypist. So I was really quick at this. <clears throat> 
So I got the job at Channel 9, and um, I got it through a woman named Shelby Conti, whose husband was a struggling composer named Bill Conti, who was the guy from Rocky eventually. You know, an Oscar winner, and you know, it's a, but he's Bill Conti. Anyway, so um, that job led to a... <laughs> because I like to talk to people, that job led to... Uh, another job at Paramount Pictures Television, which was right across the street, which, in research, again, as a typist, which led to a job at Hanna-Barbera in 1979. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm encapsulating all this because there are all kinds of weird stories that go along with this stuff. <laughs> Uh, a lot of uh, one of them, I got the job working at Hanna Barbera through drugs, but not I wasn't taking them, but the person who hired me was, and <laughs> I, this, I, God is my witness, you know. And she got fired from Hanna Barbera because she came out of the ladies' room with a milk sign, but got milk. Well, it wasn't milk, so they fired her. And she says, "You can't be taking coke. You work for Hanna Barbera. You know we do Scooby Doo. What are you talking? You know, okay. Anyway, so." And the, but I had been doing some freelance work for Hanna Barbera. I was at Paramount, and um, the, uh, I got fired because she had hired me. Six weeks later, I said, "Man, I, I gotta get, I gotta get this this job, you know, because uh, I'm losing too much money playing the horses at Santa Anita and Hollywood Park." That's what, what I used to do. That I used to make, I used to make extra money, you know, trying to play the ponies as well as, um, you know poker because there were poker parlors back then. I was a real reprobate. I had just, you know, um, <clears throat> I, I would have probably ended up as something straight out of Guys and Dolls if I hadn't gotten this job. So I, um, I, um, I called, I call up to get my Hanna-Barbera job back, which was just a freelance job, and the person who answered the phone was the person who had just who had replaced the woman who had a coke problem, because she answered the phone because her secretary was in the bathroom, and one thing led to another, and this woman hired me, and this woman became my like my rabbi in a way. She hired me and fired me three separate times, all for insubordination over the years, different jobs, and um, so. She hired me at Hanna-Barbera. She hired me 10 years later at Marvel Entertainment. And then a year after that at Fox Kids, where I became, everybody got to know me because of the shows I worked on, like in animation, like X-Men and Batman and Beetlejuice and Spider-Man and Silver Surfer and Goosebumps. And so, I mean, you know, um, and... Um, that's basically, you know, that's... So you kind of fell into it, it sounds like. You know, uh, yeah, oh yeah, I, you, you know, I, I fell into it because, and a lot of people fall into it. Right. Because those of us who didn't, you know, when I went to UCLA, I didn't want to become, you know, a production person. I, I didn't care. I wanted, to, I wanted to be Harvey Goldberg or George Mossy. And I knew I couldn't because I don't... I don't speak like that, you know. So, and I, I just ramble on, and I just, you know, it's my my stories. Most of them are, um, you know, uh, except the ones I tell you. You know, the, the, there's a lot of tall tale isms about it, you know, that sort of stuff. But, um, and, but that, yeah, you do. I, I fell into it like a lot of people, um, and I've spent forty years in kids programming. What are you most proud of in in terms of your in the, in, uh, in, the, in the work in, in kids program? The X Men. Mm -hmm. The X-Men mm -hmm. show, because they still talk about it today, yeah. because this, what this show did, this is animation from, um, it basically revived the Marvel Universe. It proved you could do this. Um, um, Singer, the, the, uh, the director of the first X-Men movie, never read a comic book. He said, I only watched the series to get my, uh, you know, to, to understand that world. And I was the network executive on that show, which meant that 
everything passed by my desk. All concepts, all scripts, all storyboards, all the, um, all the, uh, the you know, the, P, the pre, the post-production, you know, I was there with the editors and all this other stuff. And um, to this day, it's probably the most sophisticated storytelling for a show. I don't, I don't know if you have ever watched it. Yeah, I have. You know, and so, and then it's, it, it, the animation might have sucked, but those stories, man, yeah. they were they were multi leveled. There was, um, you know, there were there were there was a character Beast, who would always quote Voltaire. And Shakespeare, I mean, you kn I got away with murder on this because it was my show and nobody could touch it. And I did stuff that had never been done before in, you know, for kids programming. And, um, yeah, I made, I made those kinds of references. And um, it's, that sort of stuff has been lost today because the people who, who make these decisions are stupid and they don't believe that kids are smart enough. And even though, you know, you've got, you've got the six month olds with their computers in front of them and, you know, but so, yeah, that, I'm, I'm all, you know what, I'm also proud of surviving, you know, because it's not, it was not a, an easy business a, and, um, cause you're always fighting for tenure and that's that, you know, you're only as good as you're, as you're not good at all. No matter, forget about what you, you just did. What are you going to do for me now type of thing? Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, is there anything else you want to say about uh, your education or your career or... Um, oh. UW or... Oh, uh, you, you know about the award I set up. Yeah. Um, it, the, in, in fact, you can even, I can thank the history department for that. Because when I set up my award, um... And I had no idea how to do this, but, you know, this was like in the early 90s. And I thought, you know, I, I got to give back. I don't know how to give back, but it's a mitzvah. You got to give back. Okay. I, through the uh, UW uh, Foundation, I created this award for undergraduates. Um, <clears throat> graduating seniors, honors thesis. The ones who wrote the best honors thesis, but it also had to be interdisciplinary. So, you know, if you were a history major, you had to have, you know, you had to have a minor in art or Italian or, you know, geography. I, it didn't make any difference, and and that's I was able to fund this through, and it was hard, I, you know. But then I, you know, I never got married, never had a house, and so I didn't have kids. So basically, you know. Um, what I wasn't, you know, spending on, um, you know, on children's book illustrations, um, which I started collecting only to hide the earthquake cracks in my various apartments in, in Los Angeles. No, I'm being serious about that. You know, these spider cracks that eventually turned into like uh, abysses. I was just, they were awful. I, I, put, I, I would put artwork there. But anyway, so um, they... Um, I'm, I'm really proud of that, because that award, you know, in fact, that was the reason why I was at the Humanities place, which is, you know, University Club building. Um, I always, I always look forward, you know, to like May when I get to read these, these, um, uh, you know, uh, theses, and it's, and I, I will tell you, I set this thing up so that in a dozen lifetimes, it would have been impossible for me to win this thing. I mean, some of these kids are so incredibly smart that I can't even understand the titles. And I'm, I'm not joking about this. I mean, in fact, um, I was gonna have lunch, but she, she's busy on campus, with one of the winners a couple of years ago. Uh, her father is like a professor of mechanical engineering here. And she wrote something on theology and the video game World of War. I've never played World of War and all the levels and all this other stuff and she was the winner. She created a, I, I, you know, she saw God in all of this stuff and the numbers and because uh, she was also into mathematics and you know so, and, a, and she was a game, she was like a game player 
So she wins this thing, and I, you know, I, I never met any of the winners except this one person when I came back in May of 2014 for a memorial service for one of my close friends, and I was at Tandem Press, and she was there that night, and I introduced myself. She said, oh, I remember, yeah, you won my award. Yeah, okay. Can you explain to me what that thesis of yours was? And um, she tried to, and I said, oh, forget it. Forget it, man. I don't, you know, you won, you know, Zeigesunze, you know, nice. and uh, that kind of stuff. And I said, so where are you going? So I says, oh, I'm going to MIT. He says, really? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to MIT. Uh, I got accepted to game theory. I says, great. You know, <laughs> that's great. I can't even spell theory. And, you, you know, and, uh, but that's what I'm really, that's the proudest thing I, uh, 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 you know. Great. So. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate taking the time to come and visit with us. Now let's, uh, if you've got a few minutes, yeah. let's get back to the Greenbush thing. Yeah. Because I yeah. am telling you, the, the shenanigans that went on to, to get rid of hundreds of people, you know, that had created a community there since yeah. the turn of the last century. Right, right. You know, they, they ripped them out of their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, they paid, at you know, what, 20 cents to the dollar. They promised a lot of these old people that they would be coming back, which of course they never did. Um, and uh, they they ripped out the name. You know, I, I, I think of it as like Cabrini Greens. You know, they rip out, uh, although, you, you know, it was like Urban Blight. We're going to make Madison beautiful again type of thing. And uh, I always thought it had something to do with the John Nolan Causeway because you know, you're coming in from areas you don't want to see. You don't want to see Fort Apache here. And it wasn't Fort Apache, but, I mean, it was a, it was a blighted area. And um, so, you know... It was... It, there was all this money that all of a sudden became available in yeah. Washington. And, of course, this was a national phenomenon. And it was Nestigan, uh, oh, yeah. progressives that plugged into that money, and this area of Madison was the only area that, in the sense, housed any kind of difference, in the sense that pretty much everyone else in the town was German or, no, you know, white, Northern European. Yeah. It was the one area that they could identify, and it also was next to the university and next to the hospital. So it had, there were vested interests that wanted that area cleared it, it so was, they could... It, it, they could grow. So there were, I think, a lot of economic reasons for it. I mean, the neighborhood, if it had evolved, I mean, I think people were beginning to move out of the neighborhood, well, the younger the, generation. The younger generation was. It would have been restored, is probably what would have happened over the years. It would have been, you know, gentrified, I guess. They, but, it would have been, like like yeah. Willie Street, you know. Yeah, but, that's what it would have But the, the thing is... The, the, that they used a sledgehammer and they used a lot of lies. Yeah. And I remember, I, I remember Longfellow School used to have um, these meetings and it got really, really heated because there were, you know, there, there were urban <coughs> groups at that time who knew exactly what was happening. And you, you had a lot of white radicals who were, who were part of that as well. And, uh, but it's, it's fascinating if you go back and read the Cap Times and, and the State Journal um, about all the, you know, the promises that turned into anguish. Mm -hmm. And um, and and it just drove, uh, you know, we were driven out. My parents were driven out of, mm -hmm. out of that place. And um, if you notice that they, they tore down the triangle area, but they didn't move past, they didn't move past um, mills. You know, they got, you know, where Madison General Meritor <clears throat> is now, they only got rid of, like, one building, which was, I believe, St. Joseph's Church. Because I was there, I was watching it when that, <clears throat> when that went down in, like, 62, 63. Um, but um, it was really interesting that suddenly that area, which was also considered Greenbush, uh, wasn't touched. It was just the area, you know, with uh, the uh, with the Paley and the um, uh, you know the uh, the the Gurky uh, 
uh, junkyards. But and they gave they got rid of the Schwartz Pharmacy that went right up to yeah. to Madison General. Those two brothers, and then they tra they uh, moved into the first floor of a new development yeah, there. Yeah, but I do recall they they tore down that. Right it, it, it's it's a fascinating history because they they tear it down, they build up a Soviet style, which they're trying to tear down now, apartment building, <clears throat> and for years, decades actually, there were there were vacant lots. Uh -huh. They were just right, vacant lots. It's it like, wait yeah. a minute, <laughs> you were promising all these old, and you know, it's basically all the old people died. They uh -huh. all just died. And... Um, so you've got a couple of, uh, you can see I'm still pissed off about yeah. this because I remember going to these meetings and these old folks, you know, they were in their 60s, 70s, 80s. They were crying because they were being thrown out of their homes and they really didn't know where, you know, where they were going to end up. So they ended up on the south side, you know, and uh, you've never had as integrated an area of Madison since then. Oh, it's true. You really haven't, and you know um, that's true all over the country. That that's what happened. Uh, you took integrated neighborhoods and separated them out, basically. And it was a working. It was a working class neighborhood. It wasn't, you know, where everybody was on welfare. I mean, you know, they worked at that Gishold, Rayovac, Oscar Mayer, and so again, you know. <clears throat> There's, there's a, and you can, you can compare it. You're right. The, the, the federal response after World War II, of, uh, <clears throat> you know, getting rid of certain areas and and building them up and trying to create suburb, you know, suburban uh, uh, plots. Well, you know, I'm just telling. Right. right. So.